Good evening, everybody. I'm, my name is Joe Stiebrick, and uh, I can see a lot of you had nothing better than to do on a Tuesday <laughs> night than to, than, than to come to hear an old guy uh, tell stories that may or may not be true. Um, just as we get started, some, some ground rules. Uh, there really aren't any. Um, please feel free to ask questions as, as they come up. If I say something particularly irritating, you know, ask me about it or a challenge or, or whatever, I'm hoping that this will turn into a dialogue rather than just be uh, a monologue. I don't view the questions as an interruption. Um, also, the PowerPoint that I, I'd be using um, it, it, you can download, uh, I'll post it online in about a week or so from our, our website, buildingscience.com. Uh, there's no secrets in building science, so please feel free to uh, uh, email, uh, and we'll, we'll try to get information to you. Um, I get about 500 emails a day, so be patient. 480 of them are from uh, banking opportunities in, Ni in Nigeria. And, and Viagra ads. I don't know how they know that I need <laughs> apparently both of those services, but, but they do. So you know, be, be, be patient. We're, we're, not a, we're, not a, we're not a big firm. We're just having a, a hell of a lot of fun. A um, little bit of background. I've been coming to um, Aspen and, and Carbondale since uh, the mid-1980s, and uh, it sort of turned my, my career around. And so I, I, I view this as, 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 as my home, uh, uh, not just a place to hang out and, and ski and, and, and drink expensive wine. Um, so um, I have a lot of friends here and some who I've known for 20, 30 years. It's, it's kind of nice to come, come back here. So with, uh, without further ado, <clears throat> um, I thought I'd start by defining what a building is. And uh, a building is a different thing to different people. From a building science perspective, it's an environmental separator. It keeps the outside out and the inside in. Make sense? You know, which immediately puts us in conflict with architects who are always trying to connect the inside to the outside and the outside to the inside. Um, sometimes the outside sucks and you don't want it inside. Sometimes the inside sucks and you don't want the inside in the thing that separates the inside from the outside. If I'm going too fast, stop me here. I mean, I, I, I realize that this is, these are complicated concepts. What are the odds that um, that thing that separates the inside from the outside is going to be done perfectly? Well, slim to none, and slim has just left town, right? So sometimes the inside is going to get into the thing that separates the inside from the outside, and we have to decide whether to let it through or kick it back. And sometimes stuff from the outside gets into the thing that separates the inside from the outside, and we have to decide whether to kick it back or let it through. Make, make sense? Now, how much we kick back and let through in each direction depends on, on four things, in my opinion. A lot of people don't like to admit that what they're saying is an opinion. Now, I, I think I have pretty good basis for my opinions, but it's an opinion, all right? You are free to make your own decisions. So the first and foremost, from my perspective, is where is the building located? There's a big difference between Miami and Minnesota. So the physical location of the building establishes the external environmental load, right? How much rain, what's the temperature, what's the relative humidity, um, how much snowfall does the earth move under your feet? Okay, that was a Carol King song that apparently <laughs> I am a generation or two removed from. I actually saw Elvis when he was thin. Okay, so just to let you, just to let you know. So the location of the building establishes the external environmental load, and it matters a great deal. There's, there's no, shouldn't be controversy there, but. How can you have one building design for the entire country? That makes no sense, but there you go. You can have one burger chain that makes the same burger, but it probably shouldn't be manufactured in the same building. Just a thought. Well, if that's number one. Number two would be the internal environmental load, right? What's going on inside? 
There's a big difference between a warehouse and a humidified, pressurized hospital, art gallery, museum, swimming pool, or whatever, right? So we need to know two things now. What's the external environmental load? What's the internal environmental load? The third thing, this gets more controversial now, is what makes up, what materials make up that environmental separation? There's a big difference between building out of thousand-year-old trees and rocks than out of was wood. Um, was wood, it used to be wood, but it's not wood no more. Um, engineered wood is an insult to both wood and to engineers. <laughs> OSB is the spam of wood. <laughs> spam is the OSB of luncheon meats. These are really good lines, folks. I mean, <laughs> This is, I mean, you know, you know cut, me a, cut me a break here. Okay, you, you, you youngsters apparently don't get this, but yeah. let, me, let me explain. We used to go to places called forests and cut trees down, and we would cut them into boards and make boats out of them and sail them around the world. Try doing that with a sheet of OSB, right? So you really think that the stuff you're building out of hasn't changed? We used to have wet applied interior finishes. We had plaster. Now we have drywall, paper-faced gypsum. And we line the entire, entirety of our buildings with paper. We're building paper buildings. Even the dumbest of the three little pigs didn't build his house out of paper. <laughs> Back in the day, the big bad wolf would huff and puff. All he does now is lift his leg. <laughs> so you really think that you can still do the stuff that you used to do, but you can't. Now, what are the odds that we're going to go back to build out of thousand-year-old trees and rocks? It's not going to happen. All right. So number one is the external environmental load. Number two is the internal environmental load. Number three are the materials that comprise the environmental separation. Number four is why I don't get invited usually to USGBC green programs, and why I don't get invited to the architectural galas, and I'm not, I'm not welcome in Georgetown anymore, except when they screw up their house. It's energy. Um, what have we done to the energy exchange of our building enclosures? We've dramatically reduced it, right? And what are the odds that we're going to continue to do that? It's going to happen. Well, guess what? There's no such thing as a free thermodynamic lunch. I used to say you can't get your money for nothing and your chicks for free, but apparently that's <laughs> sexist. <laughs> but I'm old enough that I don't care. You see, I, I can't be fired. I'm a legend. <laughs> So I can tell stuff that would get other, the youngsters into trouble. Look, we build stuff outside and it gets wet. And we build out of wet materials. We've always been doing that. But we haven't had trouble if the materials could dry. Repeated wetting followed by repeated drying has never been an issue. And especially if you've been building out of thousand-year-old trees and rocks. Drying involves an energy exchange. The more energy inefficient the building is, the higher the drying potential. You could do stupid stuff in a poorly insulated building. You can't do stupid stuff in an extremely well insulated building. People were running around saying, oh, save energy. It makes the building work better. It's all easier. Liar, liar, pants on fire. You have to be really freaking good because there's no room for air anymore. You know, ener this energy thing, I'm, by the way, I'm, I'm an engineer three times over. I'm born with a genetic defect, as most engineers are. It's the efficiency gene, right? I, I was into this energy thing before it became a cool thing to be into the energy thing. I mean, I've been doing energy efficiency for 40 years. But I learned that it doesn't come for free without consequences. 
the more energy efficient you make your building, which I want you to do, by the way, the lower the drying potential, which means you have to intervene on preventing it from getting wet in the first place or design around the water sensitive materials. That means, oh my God, I can't put stucco over OSB anymore. I have to put an airspace behind it. Well, why? Well, because I used to put it over boards in a poorly insulated wall. Now I'm putting it over OSB with fluffy shit up the yin yang. That's a metric term, it's two wazoos. <laughs> so I have to compensate for that. So I'm not anti-efficiency, I'm not anti the materials, I'm just telling you that it's different now, all right? And because it's different, and people aren't accepting that fact, we're getting failures. And I rarely get a call, Joe, Joe, it's freaking fabulous, come on, let's have a beer. I don't get those calls. I get the call at three in the morning. The vampires are coming. The shit has hit the fan. It's the end of the world. They're taking my house and the kids and whatever. Ah. All right. And so we have more problems because we're not accepting the fact that energy comes with consequences. I do not want to go back to energy inefficient, uncomfortable buildings. And we're not going to be building out of thousand year old trees and rocks, but we have to do it differently. So that's the politics. Apparently I farted in the cathedral and I'm not invited anymore. <laughs> so here are the rules for environmental separation. They're not mine. Uh, this is from the 1950s before I was born. Um, there are 14 of them. They're not equally important. The ones that'll kill you are more important than the ones that'll irritate you. Really. And the ones that will kill you quickly are more important than the ones that will kill you slowly. And the ones that will irritate you quickly are more important than the ones that will irritate you slowly. Are you with me on this? So you have to prioritize. It's not a good idea to kill people. The English forgot that at Grenfell Towers. 80 people died in a super energy efficient retrofit. Nobody's talking about it. Oh, it burned and they died. Well, yeah, what started the fire? Well, a refrigerant leak with a flammable refrigerant. What are you people, nuts? Well, it has a, high, has a low greenhouse gas potential. Yeah, but it burns. We stopped doing stupid shit like that in the 30s. What are you, insane? And so let's wrap the building with flammable stuff. Oh yeah, but we saved a lot of energy and it looks cool. Stop it. Stop doing stupid stuff that'll kill people. That's not a popular message. Until I told you this, how, did, do, how many of you even knew that it was a stupid design? It would have never happened here because of an old guy by the name of, of Jesse um, who, came up with NFPA 285, which makes us burn the walls before we build them. Well, we never had to do that before. Well, that's because fires went up the inside of a building and we learned to compartmentalize. Jesse Beidel said, well, wait a minute. The fire can go up the outside and pop in. And that's what happened. We, we need to, you just can't wrap the outside of your building with stuff without understanding that you've dramatically changed things. I want you to wrap the outside of your building, okay? I do. You just have to do it differently because it's important not to kill people, except the ones that deserve it. <laughs> That's meant as a joke. I don't think that is. <sighs> All right. We're focusing on the top part of the list today because we've really done a really good job most of the time on the bottom part of the list. You know, we, not too many people die. It would be nice to keep that record. Um, we, we are making people sick, right? Okay. Rainus equation, nothing excites me more than the third most famous equation in physics. I can see you're all educated in the United States <laughs> and are, are therefore clueless. 
Svante Uranius won the Nobel Prize in physics at the turn of the last century. It was a huge scandal because he was a chemist. Nothing pisses off physicists more than a chemist. Okay, let me explain how this works. <laughs> a chemist to a physicist, physicist is like holistic medicine to a brain surgeon. I guess that hits too close to home here. And uh, <laughs> never mind. Basically, what he said for every 10 degree K rise in temperature, the reaction rate uh, doubles. Well, OK, let me translate. 10 degrees K is 10 degrees C. 10 degrees C is 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Using Joe math, which is a field of mathematics I invented, that's around 20 degrees. For every 20 degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature, you double bad shit. You want things to last a long time, make them colder. So a white roof will last two to three times longer than a black roof. I did this presentation in St. Louis and titled it White Roofs Matter. <laughs> too, too soon for that joke? <laughs> Apparently it's too soon for that, that, that joke. Um, the trouble was that the white membranes did last longer but the roofs themselves rotted faster. Well, what does a white roof do to the drying potential? It reduced it. So when we changed the color of our roofs from black to white, roofs couldn't get as wet as they used to because when they, got, when they were black and they got wet, the sun would drive the water back into the building. The moment we started changing the color, that didn't happen, so we had to change the way we constructed roofs. We suddenly had to introduce air barriers and vapor barriers on the underside of the roof assemblies to compensate for the fact that we changed the temperature profile. And you stand that up, and we call it a wall. Do you see how this? OK, just in case, <sighs> never mind. So the three principal damage functions that are governed by the Arrhenius equation are water, heat, and ultraviolet light. So that's the badness that happens. And of the three, water is the most significant. So if you want things to last a long time, keep them dry, keep them cold, and protect them from ultraviolet light. You want to live a long time, move to a place that's very, very cold, um, that's very, very dry, and cover yourself up so you're not exposed to ultraviolet light, and eat nuts and berries. You will live a long time, but feel miserable and wish you were dead. <laughs> <sighs> Never mind. All right, the second law of thermodynamics, that's a big deal. Uh, there are four laws of thermodynamics, but we only number them to the third law because we forgot one. And so, you know, we had the first, second, and third law for about 100 years, and all of a sudden somebody said, shit, we forgot one, and we didn't know where to put it because we didn't want to renumber everything, so we called it the zeroth. They never asked me. I, I would have said it didn't make sense because the zeroth law says if A equals B and B equals C, A equals C. You know, a dead Greek guy by the name of Aristotle wrote it down a long time ago, but apparently uh, uh, the Germans didn't get it. So I guess it was all Greek to them. <laughs> <sighs> all right, so here's the second law of thermodynamics. Heat flow is from warm to cold because. That's, that's what it is. It's uh, you, when you call something a law, you call it a law because you have no other explanation for it. You can't derive the second law of thermodynamics for first principles. You just say it's a freaking law until somebody finds an exception. See, you, you can never prove science. You can only disprove science, despite what the Washington Post and CNN says. Science is never settled. The only people that say science is settled and it's proven are arts graduates. <laughs> no. 
Anyway, nobody's found exceptions to this, but nobody can derive from first principles these things. Hence, they're a law until they're proven otherwise. Moisture flows from warm to cold. Moisture flows from more to less. Why? Well, because. You could do this experiment at home. You could take something wet, touch something dry. Dry thing becomes wet. Son of a bitch. <laughs> Who knew that? Bunch of Germans 150 years ago. Yeah. All right. Air flows from a higher pressure to a lower pressure, and gravity acts down. Now, the ones that we are really concerned with are warm to cold and more to less. So when your building is heated and it's cold outside, in what direction does the moisture flow? From the inside out. When it's hot outside and cold inside, when you're air conditioning, the moisture flows from the outside in. So it would be a really stupid idea to put vinyl wallpaper on the inside of an air conditioned building in New Orleans. Right? It's hot and wet outside and we want it to be cold and dry inside. Vinyl wallpaper would be stupid. And if you put an exhaust fan that pulls all of the air out of the bathrooms, you get a negative pressure. So you get a building that sucks with a condom on the wrong side. <laughs> we call that a hotel. <laughs> right? The moldiest buildings in the United States of America are air-conditioned hotels in hot, humid, and mixed humid climates with exhaust-only ventilation and vinyl wall coverings. Right? That works in Vegas. Why? Well, what happens in Vegas stays in <laughs> Vegas. Well, you can suck in Vegas because it's dry. There's not going to be any problem, right? Right? So you have to blow in New Orleans. You have to be under a positive pressure, right? If this is too hard for you, <laughs> stop me. This is, you know, the second law. Nobody teaches it this way because it's simple and logical. And if civilians understood this, the whole system is in jeopardy. <laughs> so warm to cold, more to less. We don't teach that because people understand it. So we say, no, it's a thermal gradient and a concentration gradient, and it's thermal diffusion and molecular diffusion. We call it vapor diffusion, and we say it's the thermodynamic potential, and we use this chart to explain it. Are you fucking kidding me? Look at this. <laughs> Luke, turn off the psychrometric chart. Go with the force. The water's going to end up on the cold surface. They don't let me teach undergraduates anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Steve does a good job with the doctoral students, but you know, we just can't expose the youngsters to this. <laughs> so 15 to 18 times out of 20, the water always ends up on the cold spot. So if you already know that, those are great odds. Why waste your time with stupid calculations? The way you keep water from accumulating on a cold spot is don't make the spot cold. Uh, that's why I get paid the big bucks. Yeah. <laughs> For those of you who are American high school graduates, never seen this before, this is a map of North America. <laughs> there are only two seasons up here, this winter and last winter. <laughs> and there are only two seasons down here, hot and wet and hotter and wetter. You should probably appreciate the difference. Um, are you more Minnesota or more Miami here? You're more Minnesota, right? Just, come on, this is, now this is my big contribution to building physics. This is my map. And um, this is, was eventually turned into the IECC climate zone map. And so, would you like to know where I got this map? I stole it <laughs> from a dead guy. It's important to steal things from dead people. <laughs> <laughs> this is based on the Köppen climate definitions of 150 years ago. Um, Köppen, basically, this is you know vegetation. I decided that the plant kingdom is a better judge of environmental loads than architects and engineers. 
So we basically use the plant kingdom to define uh, external environmental loads for buildings. Late at night, a bartender in basalt will be impressed with this, all right? <laughs> so this is based on my chart, which is based on Copen, which is based on the plant kingdom, just in case you wanted to, to know. The other map is a map of rainfall. And I chose 20 inches of rain as a, uh, as a separation <clears throat> because 10 would make it too complicated and uh, 30 would not make it complicated enough. Well, who put me in charge? I did. I, I wrote a book and became famous and, you know, screw you. <laughs> you write a book and become famous and spend 20 years, then you get to make your own damn map. Anyway, um, why this is important is that um, people are going to have to change the way they design their rain control based on the load, right? It's real easy to deal with Vegas where it rains, 20, you, know, you know, what, 10 inches of rain a year, whereas in Biloxi, Mississippi, it rains 10 inches of rain an hour. Well, so Vegas is low rainfall, Biloxi is high rainfall, Vegas is hot, dry. Biloxi is hot, humid. What's common to Biloxi and Vegas? Casinos. <laughs> you people don't get out very much. The point is, is you can't build the casinos the same way in Biloxi that you build in, in Vegas. But yet they are because they're operated by the same companies, the same architects, the same financing, and that's that's insane, right? Just <sighs> Buildings don't get wet uniformly. We have problems at the bottoms of windows. There are only two kinds of windows in the world. Windows that leak and windows that will leak. What do we know about windows? It gets worse. Windows are like people. As windows and people get old, we leak. <laughs> you youngsters have no freaking idea what's coming. <clears throat> so what's your highest risk? Where the building touches the sky, where the building touches the ground, and the punched openings, right? Not a hell of a lot happens in the field of the wall. That's not where you're gonna win or lose the game. Roof, 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 roof. Foundation, foundation, foundation. Holes, 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 holes. Then take a Valium and relax. That, that was a drug that, never mind, you're, you're so freaking young. Anyway, so um, if you wanted to really get down to brass tacks, that's an old expression that you should look up. Uh, so after you've handled the fire and structure and other stuff, you really need a wall and a roof and a foundation to have a water control layer. And that water control layer is more important than the air control layer. You want an air control layer, but it's nowhere near as important as a water control layer. Both are more important than a vapor control layer, and all three are way more important than the thermal control layer. Um, I have a lot of fun with ABBA, the Air Barrier Association of America. I mean, I like. First of all, why would you want to name something after a bad Swedish group that slept with each other? We should have had a WABA before we had an ABBA. We should have had a water control association before we had an air control association. And if you look at the, the ABBA, by the way, I was their keynote speaker a couple of years ago and they were like, yeah, it was fun. It was, it was, it was great. It was, I had more fun than the Grammys. Um, I'm not running for anything <laughs> right now. Um, but if you look at the ABBA specifications or air barrier requirements, what they really are are water control layers that have an air control function. But make no mistake about it, the water control function is more important than the air control function. I've been doing this for over 40 years, and I've never gotten a call at 3 in the morning saying, 
My building is leaking air. That, that call doesn't happen. So let's say I was in charge, which I'm not. What would the perfect wall look like? And here it is. There's the structure. The black line is the water control layer. It's the air control layer as well. It's the vapor control layer. The blue layer is the thermal control layer. It's blue in color because Dow paid me to make it blue. <laughs> Later on, it'll be pink in color. That's Owen's Corning. And you know, it's, it's, when it looks vo vomit orange, that's rock wool. How could they pick a color like, well, they, they anyway, whatever. Um, outboard of that is a cladding that's back ventilated and drained. And this configuration works everywhere in the world all of the time. That's why it's called the perfect wall. If I'm in Montreal and it's hot and wet inside under a positive pressure, let's say I am building an art gallery, museum, hospital, data processing center, natatorium connected to one another. It's probably an Aspen project. <laughs> and it's really cold, so the moisture flow is from the inside out. So what happens is the moisture blows through the wall, and it's this black line, and what happens? Absolutely nothing, because the line is warm. All of the insulation is on the other side, so I don't have a change in phase, and nobody cares. Now, what are the odds that the Quebecois, those poutine-eating, maple syrup slurping, hockey-playing, French speakers get it right? But they're from Montreal. Give me a break. They're going to screw it up. <laughs> but it doesn't matter, because if the stuff gets into here, it won't hang out there very long. It will get into this airspace and go to the outside, so it fails in a fail-safe manner. It doesn't matter what the insulation is. It could be extruded polystyrene, expanded polystyrene, foil-faced isocyanurate, mineral wool, rock wool. You know, it doesn't matter. They all work in this configuration. I don't, have to, I don't have to do any calculations. It just works from first principles. <sighs> well, you didn't do a woofy analysis. Well, if you need to do a woofy analysis, you're an idiot because you don't know enough to know that you don't need to do one. Now ask me if we do woofy analysis all the time. You know why? It's really profitable. <laughs> I love to do unnecessary expensive consulting. <laughs> Have you any idea how expensive tires are for a Porsche? <laughs> <sighs> well, we just need something for the file. <coughs> I love that. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's basically a tax on stupid people. Right? So you got some MBA Harvard graduate or Wharton graduate wanting to protect their investment, so you have to do a hydrothermal analysis. And I'm saying, no, you don't. If you design it with first principles, you don't have to do any. But we need something. OK. Do you want the expensive analysis or the cheap one? Well, what do you recommend, Dr. Stieberg? I recommend the expensive analysis. <laughs> So let's take it to Miami. And it's hot and wet out here and cold and dry in here. And what happens? The moisture blows through this like shit through a goose and hit, hits the black line. And now what happens? Well, it condenses. It changes from a vapor to a liquid. Oh my god, I've got water on my water control layer. You'd be surprised at how freaky that is. Now, what are the odds that those sandwich squashing, cigar smoking, mambo dancing South Beach folks are going to get it right? Well, about the same odds as the Quebecois. In fact, they vacation together. Everybody from Montreal goes to Miami. Toronto, we've always hated, I'm from Toronto originally, we've always hated Montreal, so we vacation in Fort Myers. See, <laughs> We don't get along in Canada, and we can't even vacation together. The way you tell us apart is the English speaker's tip. 
So this will be flawed. So stuff will get in here. What's important is to let it to get out of here and to here. So what would you never have on the inside of that wall? Vapor barrier. No vinyl wallpaper. If you have a mirror on the wall, you have to back ventilate the mirror. You hang cabinets. Cabinets used to be made out of real wood. Now they're made out of was wood, right? So you have to back ventilate your cabinets. You can't hang pictures on the wall with glass because they're vapor bearers. So you have to put an air gap behind your pictures. If you go to the Louvre, um, the French have a 19 millimeter gap behind all of their artwork. What's so special about 19 millimeters? It's the diameter of a Bordeaux wine cork. You're not sure whether I'm bullshitting you here or not. <laughs> and that's important. You should do your own research. Back in the day, youngsters in the 60s would say, distrust authority. Apparently, you youngsters aren't asking questions. Stop it! Ask questions. Don't believe anybody. Anyway, so we don't want a vapor barrier on the inside. If we lay it down, we get the perfect roof. We flip it the other way, we get the perfect slab. Ah, the physics for walls, roofs, and foundations are the same. Wow. So this is the perfect roof. The membrane is under the ballast in the insulation. It's protected from ultraviolet light and heat. So the Uranus equation is working for you, right? We call it a protected membrane roof. If you replace the ballast with dirt, grass, and a goat, you get a lead point. <laughs> Does the dirt, grass, and a goat make it work better? No, but you just feel better about yourself. <laughs> I mean, dirt is not insulation, it's just freaking dirt. If it was insulation, we'd put it in our walls, and that would be stupid. <laughs> well, what about the green? Well, you could paint it white. Well, we can store water up there. Why? You're an idiot. The whole idea of a roof is to get the water off of the damn roof. Well, it's green and sustainable. Well, why? Well, because you've not invested in civil engineering infrastructure, so you're making the homeowners and the property owners compensate for the fact that you've been doing stupid s stuff with, with, with statues and shit instead of dealing with sewers and roads and water management. What are you, nuts? Putting the water on the top of your building? Then you have a drought and the grass becomes a fire hazard. In California, we had to sprinkle our roofs to keep them from burning in the middle of a damn drought. You guys are nuts. Now ask me if I like green roofs. <laughs> yeah. When they make the building look beautiful, are you freaking kidding me? I'm tired of ugly boxes that chase every last BTU. Why can't we have beautiful stuff? I'm willing to give up performance for beauty. Why don't you rise up? You don't want some, you know, lead checklist Nazi dictating architectural and engineering and contractor design. You know, grow a pair. No, I want this building to be beautiful. Let me explain why it's important for it to be beautiful. You're all talking about sustainability and all of this nonsense. What's a sustainable building? It's a building that lasts a very long time. And guess what? In order for it to last a long time, people have to take care of it. And for a building to be taken care of, people will wa have to want to take care of it. And people don't take care of ugly things. Ugliness is not sustainable. Give me a beautiful freaking building that people want to live in and work in, they'll take care of it. Now you've created a machine that consumes resources, so now you make it ultra efficient. But don't give me an ugly square box I'm tired of passive house. Is that too close to? <laughs> Don't do this to, for the lead point. Why don't you go with the bite crack instead? 
But if you're going to do this for the right reasons, I'm there for you. Flip it around, you get the perfect slab, right? <coughs> Dirt, stones, your insulation, your plastic sheet, and your concrete. Doesn't get better than this. And we put it all together. Now comes the aha moment. We have to connect them. Building performance and durability is all about continuity of the control layers. You connect the water control of the roof to the water control of the wall to the water control of the foundation. The air to the air to the air, the vapor to the vapor to the vapor, the thermal to the thermal to the thermal. Simple. Then what do we do? Well, we put holes in it. <laughs> and so this shouldn't be complicated, but all you need to do is connect the water control of the window to the water control of the wall, the air control of the window to the air control of the wall, the vapor to the vapor, the thermal to the thermal, put it in plumb level and square so that you can operate it, and fasten it so that the wind doesn't suck it out and we're done. I've just compressed a 400-page AMA ASTM document on how to install windows. Now the problem is, is that the manufacturers of these products don't tell you what element does what function. And when they do, I don't trust them anyway. So for years, I've always insisted that we connect to the back of the glazing system. That way, when it inevitably fails, the consequences of the failure are directed to the outside. Right? A leak is not a leak if the client never sees it. Repeat after me. <laughs> a leak is not a leak if the client never sees it. Now, because it's expensive to do the ballast and stuff, we basically end up not having a protected membrane roof. We end up having a roof with two membranes. The upper membrane is the water control, and the lower membrane is the air and vapor control. Everybody with me on that? This is, this is what you're going to end up with eight times out of, out of 10, unless you are doing an institutional building or you have a client that has enough money that will allow you to do amazing things. So that's, there are other places besides Aspen and Naples, Florida that have budgets. So that means that your air control and vapor control on your roof ties in at the wall and has to go through the parapet, whereas the water control has to wrap over the top of the parapet. Everybody with me on this? All right. All right. Residentially, I can just move the water control upward and create a, an air gap. And that air gap is a really big deal in a cold climate because I want to ventilate the attic and have it filled with cold air so that I don't have ice damming. Everybody with me on this? This is, you know, a big deal. Wherever the ground snow load is greater than 50 pounds a square foot, you need a heavily ventilated attic and you want a thermal resistance of it between R50 and R60 to control the ice dams. If you're not doing that, you get basically the sun deck. And ask, you know, won a design award. We sent them immediately a proposal for forensic services. <laughs> See, if you get an award, it's not going to work. It's called targeted marketing. You can turn it into a cathedral. If you take away the airspace, that will only work if you don't have a lot of snow. All right? Good for cold climates with snow. Bad. This is great in Florida. Hell, this works in Boston. Doesn't work in New Hampshire. Well, I don't know what you call it. People it's keep people, it's, it's just a ventilated, but this is barrier. they call this a cold roof. But if we do our job right, this is freaking cold too. That's the one I mean. Exactly. We, we used to call cold roof. Okay. Well, I'm I'm teasing you. 
I, 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 I mean, I was like, the, the trouble is, is that this is also a cold roof until snow falls on it. The R value of snow is between R1 and R2 per inch. So if I now have 20 inches of snow, I could have R40 on the top of the roof, and that black line at the top is now freaking warm. It's no longer cold. I'm asking the question because um, I'm out from Vail Valley. But, um, we You're from, you, you, came from, you, came, you came from Vail? I did. Is that allowed? Uh, yeah, I think so. All right, all right. the invitation from these guys. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but we replaced cold roofs with R60, call them super insulated, and got rid of the ventilation. I think that's a bad idea. Okay. Stop it. it. Stop it. <laughs> don't, I, that's what I see in the plan. Well, I'm going to show you some failures if I get around to it. Um, I, I, on our website, I talk about de-icing ice dams and uh, dam ice dam. Those are two papers that you can read. But we've seen R60 and R70 roofs without an airspace have serious ice damming. But we have to have a lot of snow. If you don't have a lot of snow, not a problem. You can do it with spray foam, but it has to be closed cell. You can't use open cell in cold climates. Stop it, despite what the salesmen tell you. Configurations of the perfect wall. <clears throat> this is, uh, we call this, it's an institutional wall. We call it the 500 year wall for three reasons. Uh, one, it lasts 500 years. Two, it represents 500 years of evolution. And three, it'll take your clients 500 years to pay for. <laughs> it's, it's, it's insanely expensive, but it's freaking magnificent. So if you want something to last for a long time, this is how you do it. Yeah, I mean, you'd, you'd build it out of rocks because rocks don't burn. You line it with sheet rock on the inside because rocks don't burn, and you put more rocks on the outside because rocks don't burn. And you can make this out of fluffy rocks because rocks don't burn. <laughs> but you could put napalm in there and it won't burn either because you've got rocks on either side. That's why Dow likes this. See, they made napalm in a little squabble called Vietnam. Never mind. You're <laughs> The next version of that is um, commercial wall. All we've done is we've taken the, the rocks and simplified the construction with steel studs and gypsum sheathing, but the control layers are all on the outside. <coughs> Notice that there's no insulation in here because insulating a steel stud wall is a thermodynamic obscenity. If you took a six inch steel stud and insulated it with a six inch bat, you're going to go from R20 to R5. You lose 75% of the thermal resistance because of the conductivity of the steel. Steel is 300 times more conductive than wood. You know how I know this? I've never seen wood wiring. <laughs> I've never seen a wood frying pan. Well, once. So how do we insulate steel studs? We have to put insulation on the outside. I learned this as a child growing up in Canada, as all Canadian children earn, learn at an early age. When it gets cold, you pull the sweater over the outside of you. You don't eat it and shove it into your ribs. <laughs> you want to be a sweater wearer, not a sweater eater. Now. Is there a reason to insulate the steel studs? And the answer is yes, acoustically, because it becomes a drum. So you use fluffy stuff for the acoustics, and then whatever you want on the outside for the thermal. Does that make sense? Now, residentially, when we're building out of wood, again, this is the perfect configuration. And what's neat is, you can use any insulation you want here or here. You can use fiberglass, cellulose, damp spray cellulose, dry spray cellulose in the net. You can use ground up blue jeans. It doesn't freaking matter. On the outside, any rigid insulation system that you want. They all work. What's important is the order. Not so much the material, but the order. You can 
pick your teeth, pick your nose, pick your butt, but the order matters. <laughs> you are never going to forget that <laughs> saying, and I've done my job. <coughs> now notice that these are done with a vapor barrier. And I'm here to tell you that you can do them without a vapor barrier if you get the right thermal resistance, resistances correct, done right. So in other words, you can have a flow-through assembly or a non-flow-through assembly. Both work. Well, I don't want a vapor barrier. I want the wall to dry out. I want the wall to dry in. Okay, fine. I don't care. You can do it that way. Well, I prefer to do it this way. Okay. It's a Ginger Mary Ann thing. There's no wrong answer. <laughs> <sighs> Never mind. Okay, how many men in here are, are 50 years of age or older? Okay, this is just for you. We're discriminating against everybody else. Show of hands. Mary Ann or Ginger? Mary Ann? Ginger. Wow. <laughs> That's the first time in 10 years that it's been tied. <laughs> Most of the time, Mary Ann wins. Go figure. Well, all right, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so let's look at evolution of walls a little differently. Um, this is a wall without insulating sheathing. It's uh, worked really well. I mean, I, I would build a two by six with plywood have an air gap between the cladding and the plywood. I'd have a water control layer on the, on the plywood. It could be Tyvek, Tipar, tar paper, fluid applied, whatever. And I got an air gap, at least, you know, three sixteenths of an inch. I, you, know, th you know, three quarters is more than you would ever need, but something. And that's a spectacular wall. It's gonna last a long time. It's not particularly energy efficient, but, you know, it's, it's gonna do its job. If you want to improve the thermal performance, add a layer of insulation on the outside. Now, how much of a layer do you need to add? Well, the R value that you add is necessary, is determined by not having a plastic vapor barrier on the inside. And the building code, the IRC and the IMC and the IBC, says if you look at the table, it'll tell you what percentage of the total thermal resistance needs to be on the outside so that you don't have to have a vapor barrier on the inside. And the reason we don't want a vapor barrier on the inside is because stuff happens, right? And we want the wall to be able to do what to? To dry. Now, normally the practical limit of thickness for one layer is two inches, inch and a half to two inches because you don't need furring strips now to attach your standard cladding. You can attach hardy border wood siding or vinyl siding or whatever over an inch and a half or two inches of rigid insulation. You go above that and you're going to need to do furring strips. And so the next step is go to two or three inches of rigid insulation on the outside. And when I say rigid, it could be rock wool or mineral wool. You know, it's semi-rigid. And then you have a you know one by four furring strip with a long screw. Um, I on our, our barn twenty years ago, I have eight inches of rigid insulation with held in place with you know a long wood screw. You know, no big deal. So you know I think if I was building in basalt, I would probably have a two by six wall with you know OSB, and I'd probably choose Huber zip because I could tape the joints and that would be my water and air control layer. And then I would have two two inch layers of rigid insulation, pick any one that you like. You know, if you don't like the fire retardant here or you don't like the environmental impact of that, I don't care. You know, you, you, you can use whatever criteria you want on making that decision. My approach is not to irritate my clients. If my clients are set on having this kind of an insulation system, great, I'm gonna do it. And then, you know, so I'd probably put uh, four inches, two two-inch layers of, of either extruded polystyrene or foil-faced isocyanurate or rock wool, depending on what the client likes. Then a one by four with screws and fiber cement. 
that's going to give me an R40 to R45 wall. How could you argue with that? You want to go to net zero, that's where you start. All right. You want to go farther, you can put a truss on the wall. And get yourself an R60 wall. You want an R80 wall, build a double wall. But the water and air control layer is here, and then we have an addition water, water control layer there. Yes, sir? What about uh, six, uh, structural insulated panels? I'm, they're difficult to work with. I don't view them as ultra high performance. Can you make them work? Well, yeah, absolutely. The, what you want is you want to make sure that whatever cladding system you put on the wall has to have an air gap behind it because nobody can figure out how to make those joints airtight enough, which is not going to happen. Remember, that SIP wall can't dry into the foam core. It can only dry to the outside, so it has to have a gap. When you're building your roof, you absolutely have to have at least a two inch to two and a half inch gap um, because of the ice damming issues, right? And there's no way you're going to make that SIP panel joint airtight enough because there's going to be leakage and you have to compensate for it. Now you try, you really freaking try to make it airtight underneath, but I'm here to tell you you will not succeed. Now I wrote a book on SIPs telling you how to how you can do that. I used to own a SIP company. I only lost three quarters of a million dollars on that one. I found I could make more money talking about things than actually <laughs> doing them. <laughs> Who's going to ask me about ICFs? Apparently nobody's got the courage to ask me about ICFs. What about they work, but they're architecturally limiting, right? We build a lot of apartment buildings them out of them in cold climates because it, we can't have large windows. So they're ultra efficient because the architects are prevented from having big windows. Windows are big freaking thermal holes. If somebody says, I've got a high performance building that's all glass, I kind of roll my eyes and say, you're an <laughs> idiot, you're an idiot. Probably a McGill graduate. <laughs> it's a semi good university in Montreal. Ask me why we hate Montreal so much. Because they keep winning Stanley Cups. <laughs> My Toronto Maple Leafs have not won in 51 years, six months, 14 days, three hours. But this year, the best player on the Toronto Maple Leafs is an American from Arizona. <laughs> You're all welcome in Canada, by the way, because <laughs> you sent us Austin Matthews. On his first game as a professional, he's playing in Ottawa, he scores five goals. No rookie in his first game in the history of the NHL scored five goals. And they're all, everybody's talking about him, and he comes out for the interview. And he says, I don't understand why you're happy we lost in overtime. They lost six to five. And the guy that scored, I screwed up. I cost my team the game. And he walked out. And at that point, we wanted to make him prime minister. <laughs> 19 year old kid. Ah, yeah. But they're going to break my heart. This is like, like being a Jets fan. All right. So there's the evolution. I think you should be doing this. I think you should be here. You're 8,000 to 9,000 feet, right? And you know, you want to be net zero. The best way to be net zero is to reduce the size of your renewables, right? You go as far as you can on conservation, and then the last bit you throw on the renewables. And the general ratio that I've been playing with over the last 30, 40 years is you know, 75, 25, where you go 75% of the way with conservation, and the last 25% you go with your renewables. Anyway, I, it's just my opinion, and I'm always right, <laughs> except when I'm not. Joe, how do you deal with the contractor who's going to whine about or the client who's not going to be able to afford it? 
Well, all right. Um, then you're going to have to compromise. You're not in the net zero business. Okay, you all don't understand. It's expensive to build net zero. We'll, we'll get a tax credit. Well, the money has to come from somewhere, right? Now, if we were smart, we wouldn't be subsidizing solar panels, we'd be subsidizing conservation. I, I've done a bunch of them in my career, and, 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 and um, we find that, okay, I, we did a, took a 1910 Sears Kid House in, 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 in Concord, Massachusetts, and we reduced the utility bill from $800 a month to $75 a month. And the idea is that that money that we saved could have paid for the energy conservation, but I couldn't finance it. Now, I'm rich, we just wrote a check, but I could subsidize a piece of shit PV array with a tax credit, that's insane. They're not even made here. You know, you should subsidize the work locally, the people doing the work locally. So we have a financing issue. We could actually make it work. But, you know, they're, the Democrats or the Republicans aren't taking my calls right now. So I'm, I'm, I've asked Putin to help me. <laughs> All right, that's a wall. All right. Uh, this is a, a calculation that I never want you to make, but everybody in the world wants you to make it. So I want you to know why you should not have to make it by actually making it. It's called the dew point calculation. And so if it's 70 degrees Fahrenheit inside and zero degrees outside, that black line is the thermal gradient through the wall. Everybody with me on that? And it's, it's idealized. It's just, you know, it's a first order approximation, meaning it's within 10%. Okay, give me a break. If you're within 10%, declare victory, right? Um, so let's say I've humidified the interior of my building to 50% relative humidity, and it's 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's zero degrees Fahrenheit outside. First of all, that's a colossally insane, stupid thing to do. Um, that would mean that would be a hospital or an art gallery, right? Dumb. So if I take 50% relative humidity air at 70 degrees Fahrenheit and I cool it down, what happens to the relative humidity? It goes up, right? And at some point it gets to 100%. We call that the dew point. Well, the dew point temperature for 70 degree Fahrenheit air at 50% relative humidity is 49 degrees. I know this because I have no life. <laughs> Using Joe math, that's around 50 degrees. So in the middle of the wall, it would be what, 35 degrees? Right, it's zero, what? So 50 degrees would be right here. And I cleverly put in a dashed line right there. <laughs> Because I, you know. And so the dew point is that dot, that's where condensation should occur. But in all of the walls and all of the gin joints I've been in throughout the world, I'm, I'm channeling Casablanca, which was the greatest movie of all time. Um, I've never seen condensation there. And in fact, it's physically impossible for it to happen because when you have condensation, it's a change in phase, and in a change in phase, an enormous amount of energy is released. Okay, so if I have one pound of water at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and I want to warm it up one Fahrenheit degree, or cool it down one Fahrenheit degree, I need to add or remove one British thermal unit. So one BTU is the energy necessary to change one pound of water, one Fahrenheit degree. Now, if I have water in the liquid phase at 32 degrees, and I want to convert it to ice in the solid phase at 32 degrees, I have to remove over a thousand BTUs. Whoa. 
If I have one pound of water in the vapor form and I want to convert it to one pound of water in the liquid form, I have to remove over a thousand BTUs. You could like look this up in something called a book. They're, they're found at places called libraries, but they're very old books. And so you have to ask a librarian and that involves a social interaction, which is why you youngsters know nothing about this. There isn't enough thermal mass in fiberglass or cellulose fibers to handle the change in phase energy. What you need for condensation is a surface, a condensing surface with sufficient thermal mass to handle this change in phase. We call that a condensing surface. So the first condensing surface is the back side of the sheathing. So when somebody says, where is the dew point location? I don't have to do a calculation. It's always going to be where? On the back side of the sheathing. I have a climate simulator, and I, I like to screw with the youngsters uh, at the university. I, I, don't call, I don't view it as harassment. I view it as, as education. So hey, Dr. Joe, you want us to crank it up to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 50% relative humidity on the other side? How cold do you want to go? Well, can you go to minus 40? Well, yeah. So what's special about minus 40? Both scales cross at minus 40. Minus 40F is minus 40C. We call it minus 40FC for fucking cold. <laughs> and the dew point is right freaking here, but where's all the frost? <coughs> wow! This is magic! This is a physics book, never mind. The first condensing surface in old buildings was the inside pane of glass, because the glass was shitty. And that saved old buildings. You could never have more than 20 degrees, 20 percent to 25 percent relative humidity in a cold climate with a single pane of glass, because all the water would condense on the window. Save the wall. Yeah. Then what happened? We had storm windows and then double glazing. The window industry made better windows. Bastards. So the condensing surface moved from the glass to the wall cavity. Right? Ah. Oh. So what do we do? Oh, where's the first condensing surface in a vented attic? The dew point is in the middle of the fluffy stuff, but it condenses on the underside of the sheathing and then drips down, right? Yes, Joe? Condenses on the nails. You always see those nails. Well, yeah, man. You're going to see something from Breckenridge shortly, and you're going to say, whoa, I can't believe anybody did that. So the nails get the frost first, followed by the sheathing. The rafters see nothing because they're one or two degrees warmer. And a one or two degree temperature difference is enough to completely change the moisture distribution in the system. What typically fails is your shingle nail holding capacity. So as you get moisture damage, your shingles blow off because the nails aren't You've lost withdrawal strength, right? So they said, okay, I think I deleted that. One of the, oh, never mind. So the way you ought to look at a wall is you plot the outside temperature in your location over the course of a year. And that's that sinusoid, the black curvy thing. Now, monthly averages are OK. You don't have to do hourly. You know, hourly would be zzzz, you don't care, just averages. This drives structural engineers crazy because structural engineers are interested in peak loads. Moisture engineering is always decided on average loads. Everybody with me on this? Now, when you look at design temperatures in ASHRAE, they're designing for the si sizing your heating and your air conditioning system. It has nothing to do with your wall design or your roof design. Jim, it has nothing to do with the wall and the roof design. So we do monthly averages. And then we say, well, okay, this curve is for my hometown of Toronto. And basically, if Mama kept the relative humidity 
below 20% during the coldest part of the year, we never had any damage in the wall. But if I humidify it to 35%, I'm screwed, right? Well, not really if this was plywood with tar paper and an air gap, plywood breathes. But when I change it to OSB, OSB doesn't breathe. Plywood is 15 perms when it gets wet. OSB is three. So what can we do? Well, we can warm up the condensing surface by insulating to the outside so the curve is here. So I can now humidify to 35% because I've increased the temperature of the condensing surface. Everybody see how that's done? And so each location has its own curve and you can do your own calculation. Well, I don't want to do that. Well, okay, we, we did it for you. We put it in a table in the code. It tells you the percentage of the thermal insulation you need on the outside. In other words, what, are, what percentage is, is the thermal resistance of the sweater? Anybody with me on that? So let's go back and say that the R value of the blue layer compared to the pink layer varies from place to place to place based on the curve. I'm going to need more in basalt than I need in Denver, right? Now, what if I don't want to put the stuff on the outside? Well, you could use closed cell spray foam on the inside to keep the, but you keep the same ratio. Everybody with me on this? Then I can lay it on, a, on the side and call it a roof or a flat roof standing it up. So a wall laying on its side or a roof standing up gives you the same situation. The least risky is to put all of the insulation on the top, your ultimate cold roof. The trouble is, is that when the snow load goes above 50 pounds a square foot, I need an air gap on the top to disconnect the thermal resistance of the snow layer. I could do it with spray foam underneath, except where I have lots of snow. Or I could do a mix of rigid insulation on the top and fluffy stuff underneath, or spray foam underneath with fluffy stuff, or closed cell first and open cell. I've got all of these possibilities, but the ratio is what's key, and that's determined by your location. Now, vented attics. It's hard to argue with a vented attic if this ceiling is airtight. This works in basalt. This works in Aspen. Hell, this works in Miami. So how do we get ice damming? Well, when we don't make the ceiling airtight, energy from the house gets there, and then we couple that with the thermal resistance of the snow on the top. Now what happens with the classic ice dam is that the snow layer melts and the water is wicked up into the snow. We don't get an ice lens directly on the shingle. So we have a gap. It freezes solid at the overhang, hence we, that's where the damming takes place and then the water backs up. That's why we have snow melt only at the edge. We don't need it in the field of the roof. If you're backcountry skiing and you are worried about the risk of avalanches, right, the change in phase when you have a temperature differential and some melting and some freezing, this wicking is a big deal, right? Yeah, never mind. You saw this already. OSB doesn't come that color when it's new. This is not the answer. <laughs> this is what they did in, 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 in Breckenridge. Let's warm up all the nails by putting foam on them. This is a, clearly a man with too much time on his hands. <laughs> this is New England where we want the snow to slide off the edge because that's, if the snow isn't there, that's why we don't have the ice damming, right? We used to do this. Or we do it the way we do it here by doing it this way. This is on Main Street in Aspen. 
Of course, but that's okay. This is green electricity, right? <laughs> this is an indication that you don't know what you're doing. You don't need snow melt to control ice damming. So let's, you know, cover the whole damn roof with a membrane. Okay, I like this, by the way. It, it, it handles one of the negative aspects of ice damming the water leakage. But these dams get very heavy and very big. And if they fall off and you're under them, you die. Or they'll take away your, your deck or something. It, we shouldn't have one in the first place. This is the thermal resistance of snow. It's from the US Army Cold Regions Research Engineering Lab in Hanover, New Hampshire. Um, uh, from the 60s. Um, this is an R70 unvented compact roof in Burlington, Vermont with a huge freaking ice dam. I'm here to tell you that just going to a high level of insulation and air tightness won't keep you out of trouble where you have large amounts of snow. Okay, just roof say what? Is that a metal roof? It doesn't matter. Why so would it? Snow slides off quicker? Well, it could slide up off quicker, but most of the time we put a, a snow fence there to prevent that from happening, right? So one of the problems we run into a lot is that the snow is melted by the sun and it melts down into a shady part of the roof, which is below freezing. Uh, to totally, totally agree with that. But if it's vented from underneath, the problem is dramatically reduced. Let me show you a couple of tricks. I'm, I'm, I'm five minutes over my time limit, but we started five minutes late, so I'm going to take the time. Take it. All right. Um, so this is my go-to cold climate roof with a lot of snow. Um, a vented airspace over an unvented lower roof. So as I have an unvented lower roof, and I, over, I put an over, a vented over roof over the top of it. Um, this is where the sun beats down, and it might be 20 degrees Fahrenheit outside, and it's sunny. What's the temperature of the siding? About 50 degrees. So that siding warms up the air, and the air is warmed up, and goes in and causes the ice dam to occur because of the solar heated wall. And this is worse with darker cladding, right? And so we've learned in cold climates that I want to put a layer of rigid insulation on the underside of the overhang and then put the vent in at the fascia. So I'm not venting the roof with warm air, I'm venting the roof with cold air. This is um, <laughs> the sun deck. And all of the snow keeps sliding off and so that it makes the front unusable except when it freezes solid. Then they have to hire Australian ski bums to chop it off. Why Australian? Well, they'll do stuff rats won't do. <laughs> I mean, look at this shit. This, but it won its Greenie Weenie Award. They patted them all, they patted themselves all in the back. We did a great freaking job. Yeah, woohoo, woohoo. So what we've been doing is we've been putting vented over roofs over the top of the poorly vented roofs underneath. You see what we're doing there? This is original and it doesn't work. We've added a vented roof over the top. At the ridge, we close the original ridge vent area with a vapor open material. So we don't want air, but we want vapor to be able to get in. So it's a vapor diffusion port, right? I'm not trapping moisture in the roof. It's able to get out at the ridge because that red line is vapor permeable. Everybody with me on this? Ah, well, how does we know that the moisture is going to get get there because moisture is more buoyant than dry air. As you add moisture to air, you lower, you lower its molecular weight, you lower its density. 
And then I've put my vented over roof over the top of that. This is the proposed fix for the sun deck. I just wanted to trade them for lockers. <laughs> give me two lockers at the base of the gondola and I'll give you the design. <laughs> so I, I give it to them anyway, I published it, mostly to embarrass them. So the idea is to spray uh, foam underneath to prevent the heat from the sun, then put a vented over roof, but they have to vent it in the wall because of all of the snow, we have to get the air out above the thickness of the snow, right? Yes, Joe. <laughs> so, well, it's in next year's budget, okay. Uh, this is in Big Sky, Montana. Um, most of the older buildings are having vented over roofs put over them. This is uh, quite beautiful, right? This is a retrofit. You can see the, the big vents over the top. <sighs> okay. This is in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Beaver Creek. We've got, uh, we've added the vented over roof with the fascia offset. And then uh, well, the ridge is covered with snow. Then we have these things called cupolas to allow the air out above the snow. I, mean, we, I, I get, wrote a report up called, I titled it Cupola for Coppola. I ended up with a dead horse head in my bed. <laughs> All right, um, I'm not going to talk about Does shallow. The yes, sir. Flat roof example have a same air gap as all the, all the gables? No, the, with a flat roof you basically live with the fact that you're going to have all that snow, you're going to probably have ice. What you want to do is you want to make sure that you've got heated drains. And and what's the tipping point flat to slope where, I mean, is there a magic number in terms of venting that space? The question was, uh, is there a tipping point or a magic number uh, from a slope perspective of venting the space. If it's, um, I think you should always vent something that's more than, you know, 212. And I, I pulled that number out of my butt, all right? <laughs> but it, you know. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead and, and show you um, what you can do if you are crazy. Um, you could, instead of digging down four feet for frost protection, you can insulate horizontally four feet, but you have to protect the skirt from, being, from absorbing water by capillarity. And, well, I don't like extruded polystyrene. Well, you could do it with mineral wool. Um, this is a famous architect who I'm married to doing a load test on mineral wool. So we scraped the dirt, filter fabric, stones, mineral wool in a waffle pattern so that when we cast the slab, it's stiff, right? Plastic vapor barrier, concrete, and the mineral wool skirt, concrete perimeter to protect the mineral wool. We build the wall. You get the idea. So that's, you can do this with foam, you can do this with mineral wool, you could do this with, with whatever. And instead of digging down, you insulate horizontally. Um, so they call this the Swedish foundation, and I, I, I chuckle because it was developed in the 1960s at the Army Corps of Engineers Cold Regions Engineering Lab in Hanover, New Hampshire. Um, Wayne Tobiason's team did that work and nobody in the United States cared. At the same time, Eli Robinsky, who is actually a, Sy a Syrian immigrant into Canada at the University of Toronto, was doing exactly the same thing. Um, a bunch of Swedish builders, you know, got lost looking for Animal House at Dartmouth. <laughs> Ended up in Hanover and said, wow, this is awesome. Of course, they said that in Swedish. They went back to Sweden and they started doing shallow frost protective foundations. 
and a bunch of builders from the United States on an NHB you know, junket went to Sweden and said, wow, this is freaking fabulous, the Swedish foundation system. So the Swedish foundation system is really an American foundation system, but apparently we trusted the Swedes better. It's all marketing. Uh, this gives you the frost depth, which tells you how wide the foundation <laughs> should be. One of the principles we learned in building the Alaska Highway was, first of all, the Alaska Highway isn't in Alaska. It's the highway to Alaska. It goes through Canada. And uh, what happened was is that um, the Japanese invaded the United States. They landed in the Aleutian Islands, and they were island hopping, and people were very worried that they're going to invade Chicago through Alaska, through Canada. And so we built a highway to defend Alaska. My father, being my father, a fighter pilot in Europe, said, well, that's fucking stupid. There's no highway. Why should we build a freaking highway? They can't get to us unless we build the highway. Don't build the damn highway. See, dad, right? <laughs> By the way, I've become him. Anyway, what ended up happening was is that the 10th Mountain Division and the uh, Devil's Brigade, which is a great movie with William Holden and Cliff Robertson, kicked them out and then they came and they fought the, the Germans in Italy and they came back and they founded the ski industry in the United States. That's why you've got those statues of those soldiers carrying guns while they're skiing. That all happened here, Cape uh, Camp Hale. Now, the reason I know about that is because it was staffed with volunteers organized by the ski patrol. And I was a ski patroller for 20 years, and so we know that story, so yeah. <laughs> anyway, we learned that frost heaves in the direction of heat loss. So with the bridge abutments, it was a nightmare. And so the idea was just add some insulation there, and you change the direction of the force, and now you don't have to make the bridges strong. So by insulating, you can change the direction of the loads. Okay, this is a big deal. Um, if you were to have your basement colder than the ground, the ground will heave into your basement. But if your basement is only five degrees warmer than the ground, you never get frost heave. Do you follow? So that's why you say, well, look, if you're going to go away for the winter, leave your furnace on, set it at 45 degrees, you're never going to have frost heave. Do you, do you follow? Yes, Joe, I guess that's why it happens. Uh, now, in an uninsulated and heated basement, these are your isotherms. This is the way the temperature profile of the ground looks. And notice that the snow is less thick at the house perimeter because of the heat loss. You might think this is a simple cartoon, but this is just very sophisticated. <laughs> well, when we insulate up the wazoo on the inside of these, we then change dramatically the isotherms. And the worry is, is that if the soil is wet and it freezes, when it heaves, it'll lift the building off its foundation. Do you follow? Yes, Joe. All right. So we can change the direction of the heat flow by using horizontal insulation. That way we get rid of the risk. Now, if this is a concrete wall in one piece, there's not much of a risk. If it's a block wall or a rubble wall, there is a risk, right? Yes, Joe, there is a risk. Now, if you just get rid of the water with a freedom drain, French drain, <laughs> okay, French freedom, freedom fries. <sighs> All right, it, you don't need very much. In other words, you can just dig down, you know, two feet, shovel width, put in a, a perimeter drain, cap it with a, a paver, or, you know, you prevent water from saturating the ground beside your foundation, you never have a risk. Do, do you follow? You need water and shitty drainage 
to cause trouble. Or you can change the temperature to control things. Now, a lot of these rubble foundations are so porous that the rubble itself becomes the drain. We do a lot of work in New England. Well, this should have been trashed a long time ago. How come? Well, the ground isn't wet because we're draining it into the building. <sighs> All right. Uh, last couple of images. Um, this is the old stuff from the Chicago from the Chicago World's Fair in 1870. And then this is our version of advanced framing today. 24 inch centers, single plates, two stud corners, no jacks, no cripples, headers only on load bearing walls. Two stud corners, the clips, connector plate, cross ridge. You have a slice if you want, a splice. You want to push the header if you have one away from the drywall because the header moves. When it does, it'll crack the gypsum board. The best way to keep gypsum board from not cracking is don't attach it to wood. So push the wood away. This is beautiful, isn't it? Everything lines up. No jacks, no cripples. You don't need them. Two stud corners, clips, interior walls. Shit, just a little plate. Shear, only need them at the corners. So you, you, know, you take your inch and a half rigid insulation and reduce it to an inch thick at the corner because a half an inch will be your shear wall. Small gap to back ventilate your trim and your siding with strips. Tape the joints. You got yourself a very low cost, high performance building. All right, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is the part where we play stump the chump, <laughs> and I'm the chump, and you're, you get to ask the questions. So we only have time for like a couple of okay. questions. I, I have a question, Joe. So with the uh, insulation layer on the outside, you say it could be any type of foam insulation. Well, it doesn't have to be foam. It could be mineral wool. It could be rock wool. So, so it doesn't really matter whether moisture penetrates that layer or not? Well, I'm, that uh, doesn't really allow moisture penetration. Well, no. If I have rock wool, I'll have a water and air control layer behind it. Mm -hmm. So I don't care if it penetrates the rock wool as long as it doesn't get past the rock wool water control layer interface, right? Right. But if it's blue board? If it's blue board, um, you can just tape the joints of the blue board. Now, we do that with low rise. When we start getting above two or three floors, I put a draining layer behind the blue board supported by my sheathing. So if I'm, if I, if I'm doing a, a five-story apartment building, if I have, say, gypsum board sheathing, you know, dense glass gold, I'll probably put a, a water and air control membrane on that. I, I usually use a fluid applied. And then I put, um, the mineral wool over that. And I get drainage because mineral wool drains. Right? Okay. You had a question, sir. No? I answered it. I'm always afraid when I ask you, Jim, but go for it. I wanted to hear your thoughts on HRVs versus ERVs in this climate. And okay, the question was HRVs versus ERVs in this climate. If you are ventilating at a high ventilation rate, you're going to need to humidify and provide an ERV. If you aren't stupid and you ignore ASHRAE 62.2 and you ventilate at the IMC or the IRC rate that I just passed, yay! Um, chances are you can do it with an HRV and not need humidification. So if you, the point is, is that the higher the ventilation rate, the more moisture removal, the more moisture removal, the more uncomfortable. And you get to a point where 
you know, things become so uncomfortable you have to add a humidifier. Well, if you're adding a humidifier and you're ventilating at a high rate, it's kind of dumb to not capture that moisture and an energy recovery ventilator captures that moisture. If you're ventilating at a lower rate, you're not going to have to go to a lot of humidification or excess of humidification and, and uh, HRV is less expensive and more efficient. That's my short answer. I want you to know there's absolutely no consensus to that statement, but I am, of course, right. <laughs> yes, sir. I can't, you speak up. Well, the, the condensation, can, if I insulate on the outside with continuous insulation, do I have a condensation concern? Does it go away? And the answer is, it will only go away if I get the enough insulation on the outside so that the ratio is appropriate to the climate zone. Now, that, the ratio is in the code that are in the, the ratios that are given in the code, you have to read the weasel words that go with it. It's for non-special use occupancies. That means residential occupancy or commercial occupancy. It doesn't mean a humidified hospital or art gallery or museum. It certainly wouldn't work for an indoor swimming pool. In situations like that, we would never insulate on the interior cavity. We would put all of the insulation on the exterior. We wouldn't, even do it, we wouldn't even do it acoustically. We'd handle the acoustics with panels and other sound absorbing devices. So a swimming pool, you don't have a ratio. The ratio is 100% is on the outside. An art gallery, 100% on the outside. But residential, because the humidities are, should be lower residentially, you should be you know, 25 to 35% tops, um, the ratio works for you. I think we got time for one more before I get the hook from. Yes, sir. So my question piggybacks on this: using the insulation outside of the heat, you said you could use any insulation. I didn't hear you say polyester. So if it's residential application and there is some moisture coming through the wall, is there any way polyester versus? Okay. Let's say I had a two by six wall with OSB on it and I decided to spray the cavity on the inside with two pound density polyurethane foam. That is, there's no vapor absorption of that at all. Well, no, no, just, I'm not setting it up right. Then, I'm, let's say I now put foil-faced isocyanurate on the outside. So I got foil-faced isocyanurate, I got OSB, and I got spray foam. If that OSB gets wet, I'm doomed. Now, what are the odds that it's going to get wet? Well, it's Clint Eastwood, right? Clint Eastwood thermodynamics. Do you feel lucky, punk? Well, do you? I believe that it will get wet. So I provide a small gap between the foil-faced isocyanurate and the OSB. Normally, the OSB has got a water control layer on it or an air control layer, and then I put a gap. How big of a gap? Well, about a sixteenth of an inch uh, of a gap. Why? Well, we know that it works. How do we know that it works? Well, we built a lot of buildings and stressed it to see if it works. Doesn't that gap reduce the, some of the thermal resistance of the foil-faced isocyanurate? And the answer is yes, it does. I lose 3 to 5 percent of only the continuous insulation. Now, that's less than the thermal bridging I get from the mechanical attachment of the cladding through the insulation anyway. So I'm always going to provide some drying with some what we call it hygric redistribution. It's a big word that means that I want the shit to move around, all right? But I'm willing to give up some thermal performance of the continuous insulation to make it work. If I didn't use foil-faced isocyanurate, if I used rock wool or mineral wool, I wouldn't need the gap. All right, okay, one more. I can't resist. Yeah, they are. Well, normally they're on, nor, normally we, we're framing on 24 inch centers. So I've got a one by four, 24 inches apart. 
and my, my, my screws are usually um, at maybe 12 inches apart. And, that's, and I use stainless steel screws because they're you know, one half the thermal conductivity of carbon steel. It's really trivial. Now, most of the thermal bridging of the cladding is gone because it's attached only to the wood furring, right? Well, no, it, the, the, the screw isn't going to condense because it's buried in the wood stud, right? No, that's, that's, that's connecting your exterior cladding through your continuous rigid insulation, which is outboard. No, 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 okay. I'm, not con I'm only attaching my cladding to the furring strips. And the, furring, the only conductivity I have is the screw through from the furring strip into the stud, all right? I'm not getting any condensation from the inside because it's buried in wood, right? I'm, 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 it's, in, it's in the wood stud itself. I, it's, not a, it's not an issue. Now the trouble is, is you have to make sure that you get the freaking screw in the stud, because if you don't, you're screwed. <laughs> All right, I think I got the hook. Thank you.